Well, here we are. We're starting off. The Nazi Germans. Where is it going to sit in? I'm sitting right here. We're trying to find Stella's seat. I hold them. I hold them. Put them together. Yeah. Good morning, brothers and sisters and friends of the order. Welcome. A sincere welcome today. On behalf of us members of the Priory and the Commandery, I sincerely welcome you tonight on behalf of all our members. As uh, sadly, <coughs> while doing so, I uh, must join with you in a prayer for the soul of our beautiful Lady Queen Elizabeth II, who for the most part of our lives, she has been Queen of Australia. We also ask for the blessing of the Queen's <coughs> family and friends. After several years of restrictions due to COVID-19 and its associated evils, we are delighted to return to commemorating this fine event, the Great Siege of Malta. It seems like so long, and every time we were lining up for it, there's a new rule came in, particularly us here in Victoria, uh, thanks to uh, the Premier and co. But it's been very difficult, and we've had a long, uh, dry period. But here we are back again, and uh, you know, I'm so happy to see that. The event that, that we commemorate this evening is one that occurred some 187 years ago and was one of the finest of Christianity to date in terms of its effect. Details of the battle will be seen in a video <coughs> that we'll show you um, once we settle down. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to show any more this time, but I will give you a preliminary run through on uh, the siege, as told by me as an individual, as though I was there. But then we have a very fine technical presentation to, to give you as well. After which we can have, if we have time still, we can have a little bit more of a chat. Um, Queen um, Elizabeth I um, said quite adamantly that the siege of Malta was probably the finest effective Christian battle to that, that time. It saw, um, instead of, and I don't want to be facetious in this, but instead of us speaking uh, Islam to date, you know, we are a Christian order, and uh, that I think I'm very proud of. So we'll have um, the entree coming up momentarily. Enjoy yourselves, and make sure you do smile and laugh today, because we do have a, a good day, apart from, of course, for the Queen. So let me uh, finish at that. Um, once we get into the entree, we'll play the um, video and then we'll have a chat after that. Welcome. Well, I'm here for the loyal toast to our King now. I'm pleased to have the honour of proposing the loyal toast on the 457th anniversary of the Siege of Malta. We received the sad news today that Queen Elizabeth died this morning in Bal Balmoral C Castle at about 1 a.m. Melbourne time and at 4 p.m. on Thursday London time. Her last big duty was to appoint a new Prime Minister for the United Kingdom two days ago. That was Liz, yes, another Elizabeth, Liz Truss, now the Prime Minister. Uh, Her Majesty has given us 70 years of great service and is the longest serving monarch in British history. Um, apparently, uh, Louis, the Sun King, started at four years of age, and Piers Morgan does not regard that as being a genuine start. <laughs> so he regards the Queen as being the longest serving monarch. Um, she was also the leader of the Venerable Order of the Knights of St John Hospitaller in the United Kingdom. 
Now, when Prince Philip died 17 months ago in April 2021, I was attending a function in South Melbourne for Her Majesty's 95th birthday with the Australian Monarchist League and its chairman, Philip Benwell. So there's quite an honour with today's news that it should be my duty to propose a toast to our new sovereign, King Charles III. My sister-in-law, Lindy, yet another Elizabeth, <laughs> sent me a text today saying, Prince Charles, now the King, stands for a truly healthy agriculture, both organic and biodynamic, homeopathic and realistic social housing. And thus she said, there is no better leader to take us to a brighter future. And I saw Piers Morgan say on Sky News this morning that Charles would be a great king. I agree with all of that. We're now able, and I forgot something, just one moment. Keep filming. So, we're now able to say, long live the King. It is now with great pleasure I say, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and members of the Order, please make sure your glasses are charged and be upstanding. I give you the loyal toast to the King of Australia. The king. The king. The king. 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 Another one, Allah's deputy on earth. <laughs> Not bad again. Huh? And perhaps even again, the shadow of the Almighty dispensing quiet justice. Again, not too bad. Now, these weren't your local archbishop, uh, these were uh, on the other side of the fence at the time. But there are very many venerable titles. The Sultan believed in 1564 that so long as Malta remained in the hands of the Knights, so long uh, will every uh, area from Constantinople uh, and Tripoli uh, run the danger of being taken and destroyed by us bad people. That cursed uh, rock is like a barrier interposed between us and our possessions, said the uh, commander on the other side, of course. His adversary, Grand Master Jean Parisot de la Vallette, uh, has often been described as the, the rarest of human beings, a completely single-minded man who had joined the order of St. John of Jerusalem when he was 20. He was from a noble family um, the ancient provincial family, descendant from those hereditary counts uh, of uh, Toulouse, who could count among their ancestors many who had fought as crusaders in past centuries. So there's a long line there. Controlled by the Knights Hospitaller since their expulsion from Rhodes, Mulder was considered to be the key to the Christian defences against the Ottoman expansion in the Mediterranean area. And the Knights had in fact reportedly by their uh, by reliable spies who apparently uh, we had uh, in the other team, heavens above, had expected uh, an attack uh, since uh, convincing the successful Ottoman Navy battle at Gerba in 1560, it's been uh, pending since then. The Ottomans had taken five years to research and to launch their motor attack. And this, this uh, relay gave the Knights the opportunity to strengthen their fortifications 
and Christian um, time to build its fleets. I'm not going to uh, go beyond this at this point. Uh, we have a very fine technical uh, presentation, which Michael will run in just a moment. When he's finished that, um, I'll just speak a little bit further, and then um, you have uh, the opportunity to ask me or anybody else some questions. Thank you, Michael. Sultan Suleiman I fought countless foes across Europe, Asia, and Africa. His reign is symbolically bookended by the struggle against the Knights Hospitaller. One of the most successful reigns in the history of the Ottoman Empire began with the taking of Rhodes in 1522. At the end of it, would see Suleiman and his admirals taking on the Knights Hospitaller in their new home of Malta in 1565. Previously, we have covered the endless slogging match between the Ottomans and the Habsburgs in Hungary. Since no tangible progress was made on that front, the Ottoman Sultan was looking for other ways to continue his conquests. And since he had dominance on the seas, Malta seemed to be a good springboard for that. Charles, who also understood the importance of the island, gave it to the Knights Hospitaller in 1530, alongside Gozo and Tripoli. From here, the Hospitallers restarted their Corsair activity against Ottoman interests, and by 1550, they once more had become profound nuisances to Suleiman. So it is not a surprise that Dragut was tasked with eradicating the Hospitaller presence in the region. In 1551, he struck the knights at their doorstep, ravaging the island of Gozo and enslaving nearly its entire population. However, he was repelled by the knights after trying to take the much more heavily fortified Malta. Following up, Dragut seized the knights' garrison in Tripoli and used it to launch raids. Over the next few years, Dragut managed to occupy parts of the Balearic Islands and Corsica, which prompted a Christian counterattack. In 1560, the knights joined the Spanish crown, Venice, Genoa and others, in an alliance to retake Tripoli from the Ottomans. However, their fleet was attacked by Dragut at the Battle of Gerba and was decisively defeated. The alliance lost dozens of ships and at least 15,000 troops, which meant that there was now a power vacuum that the Ottomans could exploit. It was obvious that Dragut would soon strike at Malta. The knights knew better than anyone that an attack was coming, and began diligently preparing their defences. Back in 1557, the knights had elected a crafty Frenchman to be their Grand Master, Jean Parisot de La Valette. Under La Valette, the knights replenished their fleet that had been devastated at Gerba. They began bolstering the defences of Malta's three principal forts, St. Angelo, St. Elmo and St. Michael. Most importantly, the knights embarked on a renewed spree of piracy. Their boldness at sea dealt many humiliating blows to the Turks, as the knights managed to capture the Ottoman governors of Alexandria and Cairo. These strikes only expedited Suleiman's resolve to obliterate the knights of Malta. To spearhead the assault on Malta, Sultan Suleiman appointed his trusted vizier, Mustafa Pasha, as the commander of his armies. Alongside him was Admiral Piali Pasha and Dragut. Most sources put the total strength of the Ottoman army at around 40,000 men. Among them there were 9,000 Sipahis and 6,300 elite Janissaries, with the rest made up by the North African troops and Dragut's corsairs. Master Lavalette continued to rigorously prepare his defences in anticipation of the Turkish arrival. All the buildings outside the walled citadels in the island's great harbour were destroyed to eliminate cover for sharpshooters. The local peasants were ordered to harvest all their crops and bring them within the fortress walls, leaving the land barren for the invaders, while additional supplies were brought in from nearby Sicily. Believing the Ottomans would attempt to land at Birgu first, 
Lavalette had its citizens evacuated to the inland town of Medina. Only around 500 knights defended Malta. Supplementing their ranks were 3,000 Maltese militia. The native islanders had no love for the knights, who they saw as foreign oppressors, but they were devout Catholics nevertheless, and would fervently defend their ancestral home against an Islamic foe. On April 9th, help arrived in the form of 1,000 professional Spanish and Italian Habsburg soldiers sent by Don Garcia de Toledo, Viceroy of Sicily. Don Garcia informed Lavalette he was rallying more reinforcements, but they were months away, during which time Malta would have to stand alone. The Great Turkish Fleet came within view of the islands on the 18th of May, 1565, and sailed up the southern coast. There, the Ottoman Armada landed their galleys seven miles south of the Knights Great Harbour, establishing a beachhead. From their newly established position, the Turkish army pushed inland towards Birgu, during which time they were harried by the knights fighting in a guerrilla-style struggle. Nevertheless, the invaders reached the inland walls of the Great Harbour Citadels. They had established their great cannons on Santa Margarita and Mount Scriberas, strategic hills that looked down upon the Great Harbour. On May 21st, Piali Pasha ordered an assault upon Birgu. This was propelled by a regiment of Spanish soldiers. The next day saw the Turkish host throw themselves upon Senglia, once again making little headway into the ardently defended citadel. Following this, the Turkish leadership argued over their forward course. Mustafa wished to strike inland and take poorly defended Medina thereby dealing a blow to Christian morale, while Piali Pasha insisted that taking Fort St. Elmo was crucial to victory. In the end, the latter path was chosen, and the Ottoman garrison at Mount Scriberas began wheeling their artillery towards the landward wall of the coastal fortress, guarded by the lion's share of the Janissary Corps. Lavalette's spies informed him where the Ottomans intended to strike. He dispatched 150 knights to bolster the defenders there. Emboldened by the sluggish movement of the Ottoman artillery, the knights within St. Elmo sallied out and engaged the convoy in a skirmish. Both sides took losses, but the Ottoman advance was not slowed. By May 24th, the Turkish diggers had established trenches a mere 600 paces from the fortress walls, with three rows of artillery behind them comprised of light cannon and culverins in the front, and great basilisk bombards in the rear. Thus, the shelling began. Ottoman cannons pulverized the walls of St. Elmo with shattering force, pinning the defenders within and leaving them helpless to strike back at their assailants. Lavalette watched the proceedings from his perch in St. Angelo and ordered his gunners to fire across the harbor at the Ottoman cannon. This had a devastating effect, causing chaos amongst Turkish ranks, even causing a loose rock to strike Piali Pasha unconscious, leading many of his men to believe he was dead. This symphony of gunfire continued throughout the day. When night fell, it became clear that the Ottomans would inevitably breach the fortress walls. The commander of St. Elmo begged Lavalette to allow his men to abandon their post and fall back to St. Angelo. The Grand Master refused, knowing that he had to buy as much time as possible until reinforcements arrived. He declared that St. Elmo must hold for as long as possible. The following days saw fighting renew once more. By now, Ottoman sharpshooters had trained their sights on the gunners in St. Angelo, keeping them pinned down and providing cover for their cannoneers. By May 29th, Ottoman sappers had begun digging covered trenches towards St. Elmo's walls, seeking to undermine them at their foundations. That evening, two companies of Spanish soldiers sallied out of the fort under the cover of darkness and launched a surprise raid upon the undefended Ottomans who had been digging through the night. Many trench diggers were massacred, but the Janissaries quickly arose from their sleeping tents and rallied themselves with professional speed. 
the Sultan's elite soldiers drove the Spaniards back behind their pulverized walls. They were close enough to the walls to look their enemies right in the eyes. On June 2nd, Dragut finally arrived with his fleet of 13 galleys and 1,500 fighting men. Up until this point, the knights had been sailing nimble ferries across the harbor under the cover of night to provide St. Elmo with fresh supplies from Sicily. Dragut's first course of action was to establish new artillery batteries on Gallows Point and across from Mossamshet Harbor, putting him in a position to fire upon any supply ships, further isolating St. Elmo from the rest of the island. However, on June 9th, a detachment of knightly cavalry from Medina launched an ambush upon the Ottoman gunners at Gallows Point, temporarily scattering them and allowing supply ferries to relieve St. Elmo once more. On June 3rd, a Janissary offensive managed to surmount the fortress's triangular rebellion. From there, they built ramps of wood and height to ascend into St. Elmo's inner walls. The knights, Spaniards and Maltese would hold the breach, dealing upon the Ottomans hundreds of casualties. Ottoman infantry threw themselves upon the rubble on June 10th, 15th and 16th, which were repelled all three times, with contemporary reports claiming that the native Maltese fought with nearly as much bravery as the knights themselves. Each day the fortress held out bought infinitely valuable time for the defenders in St. Angelo and St. Michael, enabling them to further shore up their own defenses and wait for the ever closer arrival of Don Garcia and his relief force. In many ways, St. Elmo and the lives within were willingly sacrificed so the rest of Malta could be saved. On June 17th, Dragut was mortally wounded in the Turkish trenches. Sources do not agree if it was friendly fire from Ottoman cannonball shrapnel or a Maltese sharpshooter from St. Angelo, but in any case, the legendary Corsair was taken out of action. By June 22nd, the Janissaries had completed a bridge across the fortress ditch, allowing the bulk of the Ottoman troops to directly assault the walls from all sides. The defenders held out for one final night, but on June the 23rd, they were finally overwhelmed by sheer numbers and Turkish sharpshooters raining bullets on them from the rebellion. The Knights of St. Elmo and their allies died fighting almost to a man. That same day, Dragut succumbed to his injuries and passed away. The capture of St. Elmo was ultimately a Pyrrhic victory for the Ottomans. They had lost over 6,000 men and over half of their Janissary Corps compared to the 1,500 defenders slain. The siege had taken three weeks, and Don Garcia's relief force grew ever closer. By June 4th, Piali Pasha had ordered the cannons surrounding St. Elmo to be dragged before the walls of Senglia. A new wave of bombardment ensued, focused upon Fort St. Michael. Meanwhile, the Turks had run their smaller vessels ashore and carried them inland across the base of Mount Scriberis and into the creek on the westward side of Singlia, bypassing the cannons of St. Angelo. On June 15th, the Ottomans commenced a two-pronged attack. 1,500 corsairs attacked Singlia from land, while 1,000 Janissaries attempted an amphibious assault. Luckily, a Greek deserter had warned Navalette of Mustafa's plan, and the knights had built a palisade of spikes across the inlet to prevent an Ottoman sea landing. They had also set up a battery on the seaward wall, which rained fire upon the Turkish landing craft, drowning hundreds. Concurrently, the landward assault was repelled as well, and still, Malta refused to fall. continued to be exchanged by both sides in the following days. But the next big engagement came on August 7th, when Mustafa Pasha ordered a full-scale invasion. 12,000 men charged the walls of Zegliya and Begu, with the full brunt of Turkish artillery pummeling the defenders into submission. The situation soon grew dire. Begu's walls were soon reduced to rubble, and Ottoman soldiers found themselves able to charge over the debris. 
heavy fighting ensued within the city streets, and as the Turks pushed deeper, it seemed that the harbour would finally fall. And yet, Malta was once more saved by sheer luck. A contingent of 100 Spanish and knightly cavalrymen sailing out of the dinner happened to catch the Ottoman camp unguarded. They swept down upon it, slaughtering the sick, incinerating tents, and destroying supplies. When news of this spread to the Ottomans in Begu, they panicked. Believing a much larger relief force had finally arrived, they retreated from the city walls back to their camp. The day was won for the knights. By now, morale amongst the Ottoman ranks was at an all-time low. Furthermore, the death of Dragut had thrown their leadership off kilt, as Piali Pasha and Mustafa were now at constant loggerheads with one another, causing further schisms in the army. Back in Constantinople, the Sultan had become very displeased with the siege's sluggish pace, and sent multiple letters to Mustafa demanding a progress report. The Ottomans' will to keep up the fight had quickly waned. At the turn of the month, Mustafa ordered a march upon Medina, only to have cannonballs fired at him from out of range. To the Turks, it appeared that Medina had plenty of ammunition to spare. In reality, it was a desperate bluff performed by a highly unprepared city. Nevertheless, it worked. Mustafa lost his nerve and ordered a retreat. On September 7th, Malta's salvation finally arrived. After months of delay, Don Garcia had landed with a relief force of 8,000 men. On seeing this force, the Ottomans finally lost their resolve and retreated back to their ships. Some zealous knights, emboldened by their reinforcements, charged down the retreating Turks, forcing the relief force to join them in a general charge that saw hundreds of fleeing soldiers massacred. By September 13th, the Ottoman army had fully departed from Malta. The defenders had lost 2,500 soldiers and a third of the island's population, while the Ottomans had suffered at least 10,000 casualties, with some sources estimating them as high as 30,000. Ultimately, the Knights of St. John had emerged as the final victor. The importance of the great siege of Malta cannot be understated. It is impossible to know what would have happened should the island have fallen, but it is very possible that the Ottoman Empire could have expanded into Italy and then deeper into Western Europe. The Ottomans had lost battles before, but even their famous defeats at Vienna and Eger came at the tail end of a spree of conquests. Still, the Ottoman wars were far from over. Light this candle in memory of St. John the Baptist, our patron saint, and in honour of those knights, soldiers and citizens of Malta who fell under the banner of the cross. Their sacrifice has allowed us to live in the freedom of our Christian values. May this flicker of light guide us to continue the important work they started helping the sick, the poor, and the oppressed. Will you kindly stand? As we usually say in the RSL, they went with songs to the battle, they fell with their faces to the foe. They shall grow not old, as we are left to grow old. I shall not weary them, nor the years condemn, at the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them.
standing here, we may also pause and reflect uh, the loss of our sovereign, Queen Elizabeth II. Lest we forget. In the, the time, the time has come for you to increase your support of the work of this fine order. That's why we're here. We're commemorating the great siege of Bolton. And tonight I was late because I was speaking to a group of people like you in Napoli. I was, talking, I was talking to the Italian Hemp Conference and they invited me to go to Naples but I decided that living in Melbourne was better. So I stayed here but I presented online and that's where I was so hence my reason for being late. And I told them all about hemp and I also told them, I also told them that it's important that you push back against ridiculous government regulation of all descriptions, everybody. So, I am a member of this order. I am a, I am a chevalier, correct, Dino? Correct. Because the future of Australia depends on Christian principles, because Western civilization is based on Christian principles. And it's up to us to preserve those Christian principles. And they, they have a big impact, because what that means is that every one of you matters. And so your support of this auction helps this order to continue that work of, of, of spreading that message that every one of you in this room matters. Because non-Christian societies, you don't matter. Only the collective matters. That's the big issue. With, that's the big lesson from Christianity. Every one of us counts. So, this is your opportunity to enable us as an order to continue to grow. And we have an auction for you of one, two, three, four, only five items. Like, how easy is that? You look at four. There's five. Five. There's five. So, so this is your opportunity. So don't think of the money. You don't need the money because money shortly will be not worth anything. Do you remember? Do you remember what happened in Yugoslavia? I've got, I've got Yugoslav dinars. I've got 50 million Yugoslav dinars, you know? <laughs> or do you remember what happened in India to the cash? Who can, who can remember what happened to India? Mm, yes, I know. What did they do? Who can remember? They the took away... They, all, said, they said the, the $50 notes or whatever it was... The 100 rupees, rupees in the 50s. ...would count for nothing from a particular day unless you put the money into the bank, you see? What a clever stunt that was. <laughs> so don't trust this stuff called cash, and it's all digital, you know? Well, now they're going to take all the money with the Queen's head in them. Is that, okay, they're going to take the money with the Queen's head, you know, so... Reminds me of Charles I, you know, so he lost his head. Anyway, but they're also coming to Central Bank Digital Currency, CBDC, everybody. So just be aware, so it's much better to buy stuff at the auction than have cash at the bank. That's the point. And, and, and another, another big issue... You see, you come to these dinners so that you can learn useful stuff. The other big thing that's happening is certificates of title of property in Victoria. There is a skullduggery act going on where the government is eliminating certificates of title. Guess what that means? You will only have evidence of your ownership with a digital entry. Do you know you need to know this? They are saying, no, we don't want you to physical piece of paper, just like that, I want you to have physical cash. And there's, you know, we have to be aware, we are more experienced, you need to look at these threats to your sovereignty, to your freedom. And the Order of St. John is about fighting for freedom, is it not? We don't want slavery, we want freedom. So, cash, much better to have stuff than cash, and my first item for you to act on this is a piece of artwork. Now this artwork, for all of you who are interested in ballerinas, now I presume this, this, you know, this is going to be 
not all that expensive because there's no frame around it. But it's very inexpensive. Big one? It's the day gas, it's worth millions. It's, it is worth millions. It is worth millions. And who would and who could tell who could who could say that this is not an original? <laughs> but tonight tonight is an original copy. I promise you this is an original copy. Alright. So this is your opportunity to support the order. We're starting small, then we go big later. I'll take bids from starting with ten dollars. You'd like to bid ten dollars on this piece of artwork. Do you know? And I'll take rise of fifty. Fifty dollars. Piece of artwork on your wall. Which part of your wall would you like it? You know, you can have it any any room, any wall in your home. 